This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to the Unstoppable Indians. Every week we take a journey into the life of an outstanding Indian. A person whose talent, acumen or moral example is transforming India. The best, the finest from every field join me, Manvi Dhillon, on this show to share their life story. Their journey to success, some of the knocks along the way, what made them get up and keep going, what makes them an unstoppable Indian. My guest today is a man who got India's middle class to fly. He created a revolution in air travel. Yes, Captain G.R. Gopinath. Captain G.R. Gopinath has had many avatars, an officer in the Indian Army, a silk farmer. But he created history in 2003 with the launch of India's first budget airline, Air Deccan. Air Deccan expanded at a dizzying pace. By 2007, it had 4,000 employees, 500 pilots, 45 aircraft, flights to 67 towns and cities, and 700,000 passengers every month. But profits were elusive. The airline needed cash. Vijay Malia saw some synergies with his full fare airline, Kingfisher Airlines, and in 2007, he acquired a controlling stake in Air Deccan, rechristening it as Kingfisher Red. Today, Captain Gopinath is vice chairman of Kingfisher Airlines, but the entrepreneur in him is alive. A cargo airline is on the verge of takeoff. Captain Gopinath, thank you so much for joining me on The Unstoppable Indians. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Do you recall that precise moment when you said, you know what? I want Indians to fly. Yeah, uh, you know, I used to run a helicopter company. And uh, uh, each time, uh, uh, you know, I used to be up in the air sometimes. Uh, there was a phenomenon I was noticing uh, when I was in the, in the helicopters uh, flying over mountains and valleys and villages. I would find these little uh, reflecting uh, mirrors from below whenever I used to come on these mud huts. And uh, I was curious and I said, let's fly down a little bit. And when I went down, uh, I found that there were uh, TV antennas uh, in the middle of a village. And for me, uh, sitting there, it looked suddenly uh, a country uh, not of a billion hungry people to be fed and subsidized, uh, but in its imagery, uh, the kind of emotions it evoked in me, uh, it suddenly looked like a country of a billion hungry consumers. What were the pillars on which you actually built the uh, budget carrier air deck? And the reason I ask you this, I know it's all going to be out in the book, which is out later this year, but give us a preview. What, to your mind, were the basic foundations on which you built it? Yeah, see, when I found that uh, wherever I went, people were buying, and this growth was coming from this other India, uh, that was one thing that hit me. But what hit me more than that was that they were buying everything but air tickets. And when I looked at these big numbers, I found that only 1% of India was traveling by air. 99% were traveling by train. The whole country flew 13 million passengers in, 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 in 2002. And Singapore airport alone flew 20 million passengers. So for me, the, 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 the entrepreneurial thing was that I can't build another Bombay Delhi airline. You know, there's no meaning, there's no challenge to that. You will only be cannibalizing uh, jet airways and in the, in the Indian Airlines passengers and Sahara, these are the three. And there was also an unwritten cartel there. And I said, I shouldn't, I shouldn't compete with them. I mean, uh, you know, if at all, uh, as a challenge for the business, challenge for myself, uh, uh, and also as a sustainable business, it can only be sustainable if I make this 99% fly. So the, the, the whole uh, uh, thing that kept coming to my mind was not, should I do it? Will it succeed? Um, the question is, how do I do it? If these people cannot afford to pay, and that is a reality, then, then you have to build a business model uh, in terms of the model, in terms of the structure, in terms of the cost base, build a model. That caters uh, to them. Yeah, that, that caters to them. Which means that uh, you, you have to, the 
only thing that, that will make your business succeed is to if you enlarge the consumer base. Because if you compete with jet, then you have to put that price. And if you put that price, there's no growth. So it'll be a non-starter. And uh, that's how I went about. And uh, fortunately, I never, uh, never asked uh, how much does it cost to start an airline? How much does it cost to buy an Airbus? Because uh, you know, Airbus costs 200 crores. I, I, I never asked how much does it cost. I never went to a consultant because if I had gone to a consultant... Perhaps you wouldn't have had the courage <laughs> to do it. It would never happen. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I said, let's just do it. And, right. Uh, but going back to, to the realities, which is, you know, finance, uh, you know, I'm sure that that wasn't a cakewalk to keep no. at least to match the finance to the growth that you begin, began to see in the uh, immediate uh, years post the launch. Yeah, then uh, the, the way it happened was then, uh, you know, like, like in all my decisions that I took, between my dreaming and the, and the doing, um, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was not much of a gap. You know, it happened almost uh, like, uh, you know, at the same time. Um, you know, uh, I never saw anything but the light. Uh, I was like a man possessed. Uh, others, other competitors didn't know how to deal with me. The government, in, in one sense, didn't know how to deal with me. I, I still did not know how to deal with myself. So I was so possessed with this idea. So this thought of this not happening never occurred to me. And like someone said, you know, the bumblebee is aerodynamically not designed to fly. But it doesn't know it. And it keeps flying <laughs> anyway. So in that sense, so I, I just went and told my finance director, I said, look, uh, you, we can't go wrong, go wrong in this, you know, because we have no competition. Because I'm going to target these 99 percent, and uh, so I, I I got five crores from my partner who was in the helicopter company. So I started that airline um, with that five crores seed money, and uh, so I called my finance consultant. Look, this is what we have. So how do we get started? And uh, uh, and I knew that nobody is going to put the money till the first aircraft actually flies. Right. And uh, we, we staked everything that we had, and uh, we got one aircraft, uh, an old 15-year-old turboprop, and um, some bank loans we got, and that, uh, with that one, we, we took off. Of course, I'm making it look uh, easier, because there are a lot of other hurdles and obstacles. But I think... Um, but the bottom line is that you did manage to get going on that conviction, that idea, that dream that you had. But what gave you the greatest satisfaction? So you've got this airline up and running. The growth was phenomenal. The passengers were lapping it up. You know, you had to keep up with, with the growth. But what gave you the greatest sat satisfaction when you look back? It wasn't so long ago. 2003 was when it was founded. Yeah. Uh, see, in, in uh, exactly uh, three and a half years, we overtook Indian Airlines uh, uh, in market share. We were to Indian Airlines and Jet Airways in uh, also the reach. We, we were going to 67 cities. And for me, the, the, the thing that each time I was traveling, uh, I would hear, and uh, once I remember a, a lady, you know, an, an educated uh, lady, actually from a village somewhere in UP. Uh, she uh, was, I think, coming to see her son who was in Infosys. And uh, we had a lot of villages like this. And when, I was get, when she was getting down, uh, you know, she saw me, I think she recognized me from the TV and the in-flight magazine, and he said, uh, you know, some of these women who are uneducated, they're very, some, some of them have a lot of self-assurance. Uh, so she came, you know, just before getting down, he says, Captain Saab, ye aapka pilot, ye hanuman jaise isko leke aaya. You know, she kept on doing that, you know, that, that Sanjeevni, ye hanuman jaise. That, uh, and, and, you know, that touched me, and uh, many times, you know, People who have never flown in their lives, uh, the, when, they would, they, when they would fly, and they would, when I would see them in the... I once remember, in, you know, when you went to your toilet in these five-star hotels, you got these boys who give you these napkins, if you go to your Taj or Oberoi, and one of them would come to me and say, uh, Captain, a uh, uh, rupee ticket kaise milega, a one rupee ticket kaise milega, because it triggered that. So we, we, we broke that, uh, not just the cost barrier, but we broke the caste barrier to flying. And I think for me, the, the biggest uh, uh, satisfaction was when people who could never afford to fly flew. And also when we went to a lot of cities where, uh, which had no air connectivity, you know, places, like, uh, places like Kulu, uh, Dharamshala, 
uh, you know, uh, Jabalpur or, you know, Bellari, or Ra you know, Rajmandri, Vijayawada. Because the whole uh, city, the whole village would come and I would get all these kind of, uh, you know, letters to say, uh, we, are, we are ready to do anything. Because it almost became like a people's airline. And I think that was the biggest uh, kick. But the, the, but the problem was that within my board and within my company, it, uh, it looked as though to my board that I was an evangelist. It was like a non-profit organization where I just wanted to give away free tickets uh, to uh, unmindful of the, of the profit. Uh, but I, I had to defend myself uh, uh, against that to say the most effective uh, way from a business point of view to make profit. I said there's no chance in hell in an airline uh, where you have 1% one, 1 of India traveling uh, to grow an airline uh, by taking away each other's passengers. You, you have to, to expand the, the oh, yeah, you have to expand the consumer base. And, and low cost, I should keep telling them, uh, was always like the UDP hotel. And the reason I mentioned this UDP hotel was uh, it's all about efficiency, it's all about uh, innovation, it's all about uh, uh, an inclusive business model. You know, um, I want to rewind to the reality check, which is that along with this explosive growth, suddenly you had to deal with that core issue of profitability. And that prompted your decision to then sell. Um, what was that final trigger where you said, OK, I think it's got to be a sale? See, what happened was that uh, uh, at the end of four years, uh, you know, we reached from one employee to 4,000 employees, one pilot to 500 pilots, one aircraft to 45 aircrafts. I deployed, I deployed one aircraft a month every month for 45 months. We were going to about 70 cities in India. But we were still losing uh, uh, money. And I realized that I need to fund this airline for some more time to sustain this, this growth because it was not possible not to have that growth to give the kind of fares I was giving. I also had this predatory, uh, you know, uh, uh, predatory destructive pricing initially with the Jet Airways and others, uh, I don't mind openly saying that. They were putting a fare below mine uh, in sectors where, they, where uh, uh, I was not, in, you know. Uh, where you needed to achieve that critical Yeah, mass. they would put a fare below mine and put a f aircraft just below my flight so that, you know, they could kill, my, kill me and then increase the price. So I knew that I, I need to get a certain size and scale, and only then I'll be able to give that price. And, and I found that uh, I needed to sustain the business for some more time, and I did not know how long it may take, and I didn't want to risk the, the future of the company in terms of my, my, my wish to control it. Um, we had large uh, uh, institutional investors, like LIC and New India Assurance, I had a lot of public money with me, I had a lot of vendors, I had a lot of employees, a lot of public trust. So I thought um, I must not take a risk in terms of, you know, figuring out whether I'll, whether I'll be able to make it in terms of sustaining, because the losses were continuing for some more time, uh, which is now borne out, because the, there was a sudden excess capacity, and some of the rules and regulations of the government, the oil prices, all of this combined. All of them combined to create, uh, a, situation to create a situation where you needed an oxygen tank. I need a little oxygen tank, and I thought maybe it's good to get somebody to invest. So actually, I did not sell. I allowed somebody to invest, uh, in this case, Vijay Malia. I thought, uh, you know, we have a shortage of pilots, shortage of parking space in those days. The Delhi airport was congested, Bombay was congested. All that combined, and I felt maybe a little bit of consolidation, uh, uh, but we had this understanding that, and I think he understands, understands it now, I think the whole airline industry has understood this, that you cannot grow uh, yeah, by, by catering to a smaller, small market. And poaching on each other's existing customers. Yeah. So that's uh, the reason uh, I, I took the decision. I did not sell. Uh, I'm now the second largest shareholder even now, but I allowed him to invest. Uh, basically, it was injecting more capital into the company. 